Well, let's uh, dive into our message this morning as we continue uh, our generation series. And I want to pull a slide up here that I want you all to take a look at. We got uh, on this side, we've got what I call the target line, okay? This line right here. And then we have three choices over here. Now, the question I have for you this morning is which of these three lines is the same length as this line? Everybody ready? So here we go. I'm going to ask it just by a show of hands. How many of you say A? Raise your hand if you say A. Any A's? All right. How many of you say B? Any B's? Okay. How many of you say C? Overwhelming. Okay, you can put your hands down. Um, years ago, it's a famous uh, experiment done by a guy named uh, Solomon Ash. And uh, years ago, he showed this particular set of images to groups of 12, many, many, many groups of 12. And overwhelmingly, uh, with the groups, the, the vast majority of the groups did not pick C. In fact, by an 11 to 1 margin, they picked one of the other two, okay? The reason they picked one of the other two is they were stooges and they'd been set up. They were told as they went into this focus group, 11 of them were told as they went into the focus group uh, to pick the wrong slide, to pick the wrong line. The experiment was to see what the one person who wasn't in on it would do, okay? And what they found was, by a rate of a little over 30%, the one person that was not a part of the other 11 would go along with the other 11 and not pick the right line. Even though, I think we would agree, it was obvious. Um, the question was, do I go with what my senses know is true, or do I go with the crowd? And overwhelmingly, they went with the at a rate of 30%, rather, they went with the crowd. Crowds often get it wrong. Crowds oftentimes get it wrong. And the church can be a crowd. And it's imperative that this crowd get it right. And not only that, that we're training those who go after us to also get it right. The passage we come to today in Deuteronomy has a bit of history. Decades earlier, the, the children of Israel were on the precipice of entering the promised land. Something God had guaranteed them. Something God had promised to them. And you know what the children of Israel did before entering the promised land? They did what any good church would do. They formed a committee. Right? They put a committee together put a committee of 12 together, and some of you are familiar with the story. Ten went into the promised land and looked around. And what did they see? They saw giants. They saw obstacles. They saw reasons they couldn't do it. But two of them went in and saw possibility and were tethered back to the promises that God had made. But the children of Israel chose to follow the majority who were going the wrong way. And what was the result? They spent 40 years wandering, didn't they? Today's passage comes as they're about to enter the promised land for the final time. But this time, Moses wants to make sure they get it right, okay? He's deeply concerned that their view of God's word and promises and laws is correct and accurate. A couple things before we read this I want to draw your attention to. Number one, this is written to the group. This is written to the whole. This is written to a nation. Now, in the day and age that we're in, we live in a highly individualized day and age. And there's a highly individualized rule uh, view of religion that largely is focused on the individual or self. But it's interesting, God has always been uh, very, it's very important to God that he form a community that's different. 
not just individuals, but God is in the business of creating a group of people who are different than everyone else and, and stand apart. Now, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is this is a deeply generational passage of Scripture. It has very specific directions for the older folks, for the adults, for the parents. Out of respect for God's word, why don't we stand this morning? I'm going to be reading the first nine verses of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that I might go well with you, and you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us this morning through this important passage of Scripture? Would you help us to see ourselves as a part of a grand community, a holy people, a separate people who are called to live differently in the world and point this world towards you? And I ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First off, we're to obey God. We're to obey the word of God. That's a pretty easy one, right? At least on paper, but we all struggle with it, don't we? Obeying the word of God is uh, sometimes easier said than done. These are the commands, the decrees, and the laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing into Jordan to possess. In order to obey the word of God, we've got to know the word of God, don't we? You cannot obey something you do not know. Now, there's, there's a couple of things I know about myself. One is I like to fix and assemble things, okay? I enjoy fixing things and assembling things. But here's another thing I know about myself. I don't like to read instructions, okay? I like reading it. Are any of you like me where you're ready to fix and ready to repair, but you're not so much interested in the instructions? Has anybody ever purchased anything from Ikea? I don't even understand those instructions, okay? So I'm going to have that, and if I have a few pieces left over at the end, so be it. So be it, you know. The problem is some of us try to do life that way, don't we? We have it in our mind. We know better. We know how to do it. My wife, a lot of times when she's watching me do this, will say, hey, did you look at the instructions? Uh, I don't like it when she says that, but it's a valid point. A lot of times we live our lives thinking we are wise, we are smart, uh, we are, um, um, we know better. Boy, I can't count the number of times in my life where I know better has gotten me into a lot of trouble, right? And my failure to act humbly and to consider somebody else's way, in particular the Lord's way, has cost me. According to a recent study, fewer than half of all adults in America can name the four Gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two of the disciples. According to data from the Barna Research Group, 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. According to George Barna, who leads Barna Research, he said, no wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are. Increasingly, America is biblically illiterate. I wonder if we were more biblically literate, if it would have changed the way we faced the last 20 months. I wonder. I found this chart telling, I'll, I'll, without comment. This is Pew Research did this recently, and the, the question was asked Christians. This was just asked of Christians, and the, the question was, how many of you read Scripture outside of religious services each week? I found this very interesting. Look at those numbers. 
the African American community, 54% of African Americans who identify as Christians read scripture. It drops to 38% for Hispanics and 32% for whites. I wonder why that is. I don't know. Moses gives some detail here. There are reasons to know God's word. First off, we develop, and this is Moses' language, a fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord. A respect for the Lord is maybe another way of putting that. And when we respect the Lord and his commands, we will live differently. It will allow, we allow the Lord to challenge our suppositions. We allow the Lord to sort of poke us where we need to be poked. I know I've beaten the drum often, but I'm so concerned about uh, how we have arrived at what we believe to be truth. And I think there's a problem in evangelicalism. More and more people are developing worldviews outside, uh, outside of God's word and then looking for churches that match their worldview. Okay? They're forming opinions about God without access or without willing, willingness to look at God's word. And then they're joining a church that matches their worldview. I think that's a dangerous precedent. That's backward. We need, need to allow the word of God to come in and pierce us. We need to allow the word of God to come in and, and uh, cut us. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When we let the word of God come in, it, 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 it cuts us up. It starts to operate like a surgeon with a scalpel removing malignancies. Sometimes those malignancies are things we hold on to very dearly, aren't they? Can we let the word of God cut us where we need to be cut? Anne Lamott, some of you are familiar with the writings of Anne Lamott, she tells the story of a Hasidic rabbi who always told folks that if they followed the Torah, it would put scripture on their hearts. Study the Torah and it will put scripture on their hearts. One day a person came up to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, why do you say that it puts the word of God on our hearts when we study instead of inside of them? And the rabbi said, only God can put scripture inside. But reading sacred texts can put it on your heart so that when your heart breaks, the holy words fall inside. Isn't that interesting? Would we allow ourselves to be broken? in this time. We need to deeply connect with scripture because we are called to be a people who embrace and imitate God's character. When you see people doing things in Jesus' name, ask yourself a very simple question. Does what they're doing look like Jesus? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Jewish folks refer to this passage as the Shema. Some of you have heard that phrase before. These are probably, these, these verses I just read, are probably the most recited scriptures aloud every day in the world. Because practicing Jews twice a day, morning prayer and evening prayer, will recite these verses aloud. Shema literally means hear. From the verse there where it says, hear, O Israel. We need to hear so we can be. Let me say that again. We need to hear so we can be. Don't get that backwards. Don't be a certain way and then look for God's word to back it up. Look for God's word and then do what it says. And let God be responsible for your obedience. We need to be like the one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Our heart, our soul, and our energy needs to look like the priorities of God. God wants love and not limited love. This passage uses the word all three times, doesn't it? All, all, all. What is the Lord interested in? All of us. What do we hold back from the Lord? All of us probably hold something back. 
Love the Lord with all your heart. What competes with God for your heart? Does anything compete with God for your heart? What do you do to foster love of God, to grow that love? My wife and I, over the last uh, 30 years now, we've only gotten good at this in the last decade or so, but we go out on date nights fairly often. You know why we do that? Because love doesn't just happen. We have to choose to love as human beings, and we have to take tangible steps to show love, right? What are you doing to show love of God? And are there things in your heart that are robbing God of that love? Now, he also talks about soul. Of these three things, heart, soul, strength, soul is probably the most difficult to understand. What's our soul? The Greek word for soul is nephesh. And that word literally defines the soul as the seat, the home, if you will, of our appetites, our emotions, and our passions. So if you think of the soul that way, as the, the home, the seat of our appetites, emotions, and passions, what are your appetites? And do your appetites show love of God? What are your emotions? Are your emotions reflective of God's love and love for him? Do your emotions look like God emotions? Are you quick to anger well, I would argue that's not a godly emotion most of the time. You're quick to judge. And next, what are our passions? You know what our primary passion should be? Our people. Pointing them to Jesus. And in particular, I think as a church, we have responsibility to our kids and our grandkids. Finally, what are your strengths? Do we exert ourselves for kingdom purposes? Does the love that exists in our head translate to our hands? Does the love that exists in our head translate to our hands? One of the things I love about this, oh, Scott, you're here this morning. I'm going to pick on you. Is that, is that okay? It really doesn't matter at this point, does it? Because I'm going to do it anyway. But Scott, you're a person, and, and I don't know if you'd put it this way, but the love that exists in your heart extends to your hands. I bet if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, of, have you ever been helped by Scott White? I'm guessing more than a few hands would go up. Thanks for getting it, Scott. In the Old Testament, I mentioned earlier that these words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, are called the Shema. What are they called in the New Testament? Anybody? What? Great commandment. It's the great commandment. And Jesus actually goes a little bit further than Moses does. You can look at Jesus' words in Matthew 22. He says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. I love this. It's so classic Pharisee, isn't it? Jesus had just silenced the Sadducees. So the Pharisees say, our turn. We'll get him. We'll catch him. We'll show this guy. And then it says this, one of them, an expert in the law. What a dangerous title to have, right? Tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Look at that too, the, the false respect there. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus says, you want to, you want to live like me? There's two things you need to do. Number one, you need to love me. Number two, you need to love others like you love me. And by the way, it's not just the easy ones. It's easy to love lovable people, isn't it? What about the ones that are hard to love? That's what Jesus did. The Pharisees knew the law of love. This teacher of the law, he knew the law of love. You know what he didn't know? Love. 
it is impossible or it is possible to know what Jesus says about love and then not do it. And that's a great risk that we all run. Could Jesus be saying here the greatest way that we live out the law of love is how we love others? Folks, the church needs to be known for love. Adults, we need to be known for love. And this is where Moses, by the way, gets generational. This is where we're going to end this morning. We're to prioritize passing down these truths to our kids. Verse 6, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I've talked about this before, but for those of you who may be newer to our congregation, the Jews had these little boxes that had these little tiny scrolls of Torah, of, of Bible in them. That's what they look like. And those were called phylacteries. In fact, some uh, Hasidic and Orthodox Jews will still use these today. And these, these scriptures went two places. One was on their forehead, and one was on their arm or wrist. Why do you think that these were to be on our head and on our arms or hands? Why, why do you think that was? Anybody? What does that represent? Yeah. This knowledge and action. Learning and doing. There's all sorts of ways we can put it. That, our, that, that God's word needs to be over our heads. It needs to occupy our thoughts. We need to meditate on it. We need to think about it. We need to pray about it. But they also need to be on our, our hands. The, the place where our work is done. The way we engage our community. Because our scripture must rule over our thoughts and actions, we need to do a few things. And, and in terms of generations, we need to make this clear to our children. It's one of the reasons I like to take young people on mission trips, even for a short time. It's not just here, it's here. They need to be a regular part of our conversation. You know what I'm really good at talking about? Football. You know what I talk with my son a lot about? Football. Uh, my love of football has diminished the last two weeks. <laughs> I still talk about football a lot. And I look back, you know, on, on uh, you know, our oldest is going to be 26 here, and I look back and I think, I should have spent more time talking about God's word. In fact, last week when we were together, we talked about that. If we talk with our kids about the word of God and what that means, are we bathing our kids, soaking them in the promises of God? Let me just say some things pretty direct here. If that is the case, it means that God's word is more important than hobbies. It means it is more important than politics or social media. Here's a big one. It means God's word is bigger than youth sports, which have become a stumbling block, as good as they are. Church, we need to do this. Consider some ways that we can be more intentional with our young. Do you have grandkids? Talk to them about the word of the Lord. There's some great websites out there that talk about some modern movies not even Christian movies that you can watch with your children, then talk to them about some of the scriptural parallels or lessons learned in those movies. There's all sorts of creative ways we can gauge our kid, kids in looking at the world and looking at God's word and seeing how they fit together and how God's word gives us instructions for how we live in the world, right? I received this email recently from an older person who goes to our church. This morning, as I was having devotions and reading in the Bible, I thought about what you said yesterday about people understanding what is really in the Bible. Have you ever thought of challenging our people to read through the Bible? Like in a year? 
she was surprised when she had talked to a class that she was in about uh, the Old Testament and found that very few had read through the Old Testament. She says, how can you understand the New Testament if you have no knowledge of the Old Testament? That is something that has bothered me ever since we moved here and realized so many people did not know very much about the Bible. If that is our textbook for becoming Christian, how can we become the people the Lord wants us to be if we don't allow his book to convict, encourage, and challenge us in our daily lives? I thought that was a good word from somebody who's, who's walked the world a bit. He's gotten to look around. So folks, who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the crowd or are we going to listen to uh, God? Because right now, the crowd, in my opinion, is as dangerous as it ever has been. One of the things that worries me about the crowd right now is people, the crowd is doing things in the name of Jesus that look nothing like Jesus. Last week, Anita and I were uh, out in our backyard. And as I'm, I'm in the pool, and, and she's sitting in a chair, and this sort of giant shadow cast over our... Uh, our backyard. In fact, our, our backup dog, Martha, uh, it startled her so much she jumped and um, kind of ran. And we looked up and a giant owl was flying over. That's actually a picture that Anita took right there uh, of a tree in our backyard with, with the owl. This is, what day was this, Monday? Yeah, it was Monday. So this was just a few days ago. And uh, as we're sitting there, that was fun. That was interesting, right? A big giant owl in the middle of the day coming and flying over your backyard and, and stopping. And we're looking at it. But the next thing that happened was the most interesting thing. All of a sudden, about 20 crows swooped in and started hassling the uh, owl. I mean, they're, they land in the same tree. They're cawing at it with that beautiful crow sound, right? I, uh, when, when you think of uh, an owl, what is sort of the pop culture depiction of an owl? What is the personality of the owl? Oh, okay, we agree on that. Wise. An owl is wise, right? So I googled crow traits, because you can google anything. And uh, I was reading an, an animal behaviorist talking, the crows are very intelligent. But they're also very quarrelsome and aggressive. And I watched there as these crows hassled the owl over and over and over again. And what I thought was, what a beautiful snapshot of the world we live in right now. There is wisdom. And it sits there, unmoved. And yet the wisdom of the world is defined by the crows swarm in and yell and scream at wisdom. Sometimes in the name of their own beliefs, their own intelligence. The owl is unmoved. By the way, the, the crows were at no time a threat to the owl. The owl would win. But the crows were gathering all of the attention, making all of the noise. Folks, we need to run to the owl. We need to tune out the crows. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Why don't we stand? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.